Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Whitney Terrell, the author of the novel, The Good Lieutenant. And I'm Vivi Ganeshanathan, also known as Sugi, author of the novel, Love Marriage. So today our topic is going to be part craft and part news slash real life. Uh, you and I have been thinking a lot about kids and what they're going through during the pandemic. Uh, the children I know have been, you know, great, uh, tough, you know, resilient, um, dealing with this period of time, even though, of course, none of this has been their fault. Uh, we talk about kids all the time, but what about talking to them, with them, or for them, right, when you're writing? Uh, who gives room to their interior lives, and how, writers, how do writers handle kids' point of view and their voices ethically? So we're going to talk today about what it takes to write from the point of view of children and to think about how or if our way of thinking about children and their inner lives has been changed by the pandemic. Wait, have you ever written from the point of view of a child? I, I you know, I thought about this. I realized that in, in every novel that I've written, but one, the war novel, I, I have written from the point of view of a child. And it, you know, like the, the King of Kings County is, is about a is a, about a young man's whole entire life, but his all, all the opening is just his childhood, right? And there were also there's also a a young boy growing up in in the Huntsman, and I'm writing about children now. That's right. Um, I have just read listeners um, some excellent scenes set in childhood by Whitney. Oh. <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, I think like capturing the kookiness of kids is. Um, and like their depth also, it's unusual that people are able to do that. Well, what about, what about your, I mean, I, I read your forthcoming book. That is not a child's book for the, well, I don't know. In movement, are there scenes from kids' points of view? Not sort really. Of. I'm like, um, I'm like steeped teen? in. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's teenagers. Um, yeah. my, my characters tend to operate in deeper retrospectives so they can regret everything as much as possible. <laughs> Because my general feeling is, oh dear, why did that happen? Um, and so that heavily <laughs> inflects all of my point of view choices. I remember I had an I had an Iowa classmate who, like, at some point, totally called me on that, and I was like, I didn't realize I did that. That's so interesting. He was like, uh huh. Have you <laughs> ever written though a story like or something from a from a chill child's point of view, like ten and under? I haven't. I haven't. Um, that's funny. I have um. Uh, a, a sibling who's a very uh, colorful storyteller and who likes to tell stories by saying, do you remember X? And then this, they will tell the story and flip our roles in them so that no matter what has happened in the story, I am the person who has committed the wrong, even though it is, it is not me, it is usually them. And so like, it's like, it's like childhood is gaslighting. So my response to this has been basically to be like, they're like, do you remember this from our childhood? And I'm like, no. <laughs> block the whole thing out just obliterated well, it your other memory. possible response is to write the story the way that you <laughs> makes you the good guy and i'm not you know you could try that well i'll get my get on my revenge fiction right away <laughs> so you know there are issues just as you're talking about about the power of writing and the power that adults have when they write about kids you know and we'll also be talking about that and fortunately we have two authors on who are very familiar with writing about young narrators. Uh, later in this episode, we'll talk to my good friend, Elizabeth Gaffney, the author of When the World Was Young. But first, we're going to talk to another friend, the poet Wayne Miller, who recently wrote for Lit Hub about writing about his own children. Wayne is the author of five collections of poems, including Post and We the Jury, which came out earlier this year. He's also a co-translator of two books from the Albanian poet, Moikam Zaccio, and a co-editor of three anthologies, including Literary Publishing in the 21st Century and New European Poets. He's the winner of the UNT Rilke Prize, a Ruth Lilly Fellowship, and the George Bogan Award. Wayne is a professor of English at the University of Colorado Denver, where he edits Copernicle, one of my favorite literary journals. Wayne, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's very good to see you. Uh, we, of course, got to know each other when you were in Kansas City at the... Uh, University of Central Missouri, which had different names at different times. Um, uh, so it's great to have you on now from, from we, and I recently saw you in Denver because our, fam our families were having a trip out there. My family was having a trip out there. 
Um, you wrote this essay about putting children into your poems. I wonder if you could start off by reading a little bit of it. Sure. Um, I, I was prompted to write something about fatherhood and poetry for Father's Day. Um, and the essay begins with, uh, with this moment where uh, right after my daughter was born in 2011, a friend asked me, kind of joking around with me, if I was going to become one of those parent poets who only write sentimental poems about his kids now. And, um, you know, he was a friend. He was clearly joking. I wasn't upset by this. But it did get me thinking because I had been worried about um, how I might write about my kids because I think we have this simplifying reductive way of talking about our kids sometimes we don't want to talk about the complications of parenthood and so um so my sense is that reductive simplicity is really for the most part the enemy of poetry and so this essay is really sort of tracking my um thinking on my way to trying to figure out how to not write in that simplified way around my kids so or about my kids so here is um uh, here's an excerpt from the essay at a certain point, I realized that what I wanted to avoid wasn't so much writing about my children as it was writing about them in domestic isolation. The sense that children are contained inside their parents' reality is an illusion of home life where the walls are paid for by the parents, the food is provided by the parents, and thus the children's lives seem to be encompassed by the parents' overarching narratives. Even under the best of domestic circumstances, right under their parents' noses, children are constructing their own hidden interior lives. And of course, the plotting stability of daily domestic life is at least partially an illusion. My parents divorced when I was eight, and my father soon moved across the country. By the time I'd finished high school, he'd married and div divorced two more times. Meanwhile, when I was a teenager, my mother was deeply ill, and I was mostly on my own for many months. Worse, when my wife was 12, her single mother died leaving my wife to be passed around among aunts and uncles until she finished high school. Both my wife and I are well aware of the tenuousness of domestic life. It's something we often think and talk about, particularly now that we're parents. In fact, focusing on these sorts of illusions, uncertainties, and disconnects is how I began writing about my children. As I watched my children grow, I realized that my poetic interest in them was mostly in how they sought the world beyond my wife and me, and how each of them was a world beyond us, even as we encircled them with our lives. We were simultaneously at the center of the world they looked at, conduits to the world they looked at, and barriers between them and the world they sought. To be all of these contradictions at once is what parenthood is, I began to realize, a paradoxical entanglement. Any poems I might write about my children would need to take all this complexity into account. Thanks so much, Wayne. When I got to that part about domestic isolation, I thought, of course, of this year and the kind of brutal loneliness of working from home, which, of course, coexists simultaneously with the refuge of being at home. Um, and of course, that's like also a totally privileged position. Many people didn't have that. Um, sure. And I wonder how your experiences from the past year have reshaped your notion of domestic isolation and writing about kids in relation to that. Yeah, I, I haven't been writing a lot this last year. And when I have, it's generally not been about my children, I think, for this reason. Um, it's, uh, um, I mean, everyone, everyone had a terrible year, right? <laughs> and, um, and in a variety of different ways. Um, and I remember talking to, uh, for instance, a friend of mine who doesn't have kids and is single, and his year was about sort of crushing loneliness and never being able to leave his apartment. Um, and my year was about never being able to hear myself think because I was living in a small house with a family that never went away. Um, and so I think both of those things made writing hard for both of us, but, uh, but I think in, in opposite ways, if that makes sense. It's really interesting because how old are your kids now? Six and 10. Okay, so that's different. So my, my children are, uh, you know, now 16 and 11, so during the pandemic, 15 yeah. and 10, you know, and so I actually had the experience. Now, there were other things that happened to me during the pandemic, like having my knee ruined by getting hit by a car that were bad right. and worrying about my parents. But having my kids around was actually quite nice. And I got to, I mean, in, 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 in ways that actually it's been more difficult. I, there's been more strife between my, particularly my 16 year old and I, now that he can go out and drive around than it was when we were like playing Dungeons and Dragons at dinner every day and didn't have anything else to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, my kids, my kids were at a good age to get through the pandemic uh, in that neither of them was desperate to, you know, be out socializing with friends or, you know, neither of them is a teenager. So they, they don't have any interest but in dating, you know, I don't, didn't have to deal with any of that. Um, and we were able to pod with uh, two other families that had kids about our kids' ages, so they got to play together. But the, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm an only child of a single mother, and so I have trouble writing when there's anyone in my house. <laughs> um, I, I'm used to complete silence and uh, and really having the space to myself. And so, um, so yeah, so this is not a great writing year for me. That's so funny. I don't know. Uh, Sugi, is that true for you? Are you I, like, I am totally happy to work in my office. I have an app on my phone that actually plays white noise. So like if the kids are in the other room playing basketball, I will just turn the white noise app on and I'm totally fine. And then when I get to a breaking point, I can just go play basketball for a while. And I'm like, oh, it's great. There's people around. I'm not lonely. But I guess maybe I'm weird that way. I prefer to be alone. Um <laughs> I don't want, especially, it's interesting. I don't have this, if I'm writing nonfiction, then it's fine. People can be around. But um, if I'm writing fiction, I really need, uh, like people could be in the house, but I don't want to see them or talk to them or hear them or, um, yeah. And so it was interesting because um, I got a huge chunk of writing done and then I got a dog and the dog is, our, my dog is wonderful. She, um, but also she's like constantly seeking my company and I was like surprised about the extent to which like, this is, it's not a person, <laughs> like, it should be fine. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, like the solitude, I, I really sympathize with, with your, um, your habits and their disruption. I think, you know, even as um, being around other people during this time, I think I, I was not alone during the pandemic and I can't imagine how, I think, yeah, for many of my friends who are single, like that was very difficult. Um, but then, yeah, like the, there, I, th I think I also talked to a lot of parents who felt like they got the gift of unexpected additional time with their children um, and that it really changed the fabric of like almost exactly what you're writing about in this essay, right? The ways in which, I mean, who among us did not look at the young people around us, whether we were parents or not, and think like, I did not have to go to school like this. I did not have to yeah. mask up because the adults around me were screwing up. Like I did not have to, like, I also feel like a lot of kids I know have during the pandemic, but even before this, have learned a lot of, as the adults around them have raged against political figures, like people have adopted a different kind of language. And like, even that has been normalized for kids and in, in how they view the world. But I'm kind of jumping the gun here on our next question, which I shouldn't do. So what do you? Oh, well, we wanted to, before we, well, Suki is talking about some very interesting things, which we will get to, but I, well, we wanted to still talk about this essay. And you, you have three categories of uh, fatherhood poems that you talk about within the context of the essay. And, and those made me think about, you know, my own experiences as a father. I wondered if you could just sort of walk through those categories um, for the our listeners and talk about how you came up with them. Well, these are certainly not exhaustive, uh, an exhaustive list of categories. Um, I, I was just thinking about the kinds of poems that um, you know, I basically just went through the books that I had in my office and thought, well, what are the, I mean, the essay was specifically about fatherhood because it was for Father's Day. You know, I was thinking about what are the father poems that I like? And then beyond that, what are more generally the parenthood poems? And then I started thinking about putting them into categories. And then when I look back in my last two books, the books I've written since I had kids, I realized that I could place all of my poems about my kids in those same categories uh, in one way or the other. But the categories are not discrete. I mean, it's very possible for a, a poem to fit into more than one of these. Um, and in fact, most of the poems I really like about parenthood do. But the three categories in the essay are uh, first, triangulation poems. These are my, my silly names for them. Triangulation poems in which the parent thinks about how he and his children separately relate to the world that hangs between them. Gap poems, that's number two, which focus on the unknowability of children, the way we have this massive gap between our interior lives and their interior lives, no matter how often we're trying to bridge that. And then uh, what I call mirroring poems, in which the parent thinks about his own childhood and relationship to his children's uh, ch childhoods. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think the one that I was thinking of when I was talking just now was the third one where I feel like every adult I knew looked around at the kids that they knew and thought my childhood was not like this childhood. And there is something about this that is also unknowable, category number two. 
for me. And then like also maybe I'm the translator of that exterior world, category number one. Um, and how do I try to translate what is going on now in the news? And so the essay mentioned specifically your poem, Parable of Childhood. Um, and I wonder if you would talk about what categories you might think that poem fits into and, and, and also read it for us. I think this is first and foremost a gap poem. Um, it's uh, really about um, parents and their kid doing things they don't understand. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, uh, well, let me read it and you'll see. Um, Parable of Childhood. I should say it's a prose poem. So it's in these little um, sort of tiny paragraphs. Um, it's almost like a lineated prose poem, which doesn't make sense, but that's sort of how I think about it. Parable of Childhood. When the dog finally died, dad dug a hole beside the fence and buried her in a boot box. She's gone, but she had a good life, mom said. It's okay to be sad. Next day, the boy came into the kitchen holding the box in front of him. She's not gone, she's still in there, he said. Look, mom lifted the lid. Sweetie, when things die, we give them back to the earth. And then we forget them there? Yes and no, Dad replied. He put the box in the hole and covered it over. Together, they walked back to the house. In the morning, the box was on the kitchen counter. I couldn't sleep, the boy said. She was all alone out there. Maybe that's how she wants it to be, Dad replied. No, she doesn't want anything, the boy said. She's dead, but her box was full of air inside the earth. That wasn't right. They filled the box with dirt and placed it inside the hole. What does it mean to die? The boy asked. Dad thought of his own father who died a year before the boy was born, a long suffering until at last his body had filled with snow. No one knows what death is, Dad said. I wish I had a better answer for you. Four days passed before the box heavy with dirt and rot arrived again inside the house. Why is this here? Dad asked. No one knows what death is, the boy said. I wanted to find out. Jesus, Dad said, and went out to the garage. Mom said gently, no, when things die, they're gone. So we return them to the earth. The dog was gone. That was clear. But the dog was also right there, just below the surface, packed in darkness. The boy could bring her back inside whenever he wanted, no matter what his parents said. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, that poem is really interesting to me for a lot of reasons, um, which we're going to talk about. And one of them is, you know, this, this idea of, of the dog was also right there, just below the surface, um, packed in darkness. I mean, for me, that, that line reads like so many things that I think are present in my children's lives now that's just below the surface, packed in darkness. Not just death, which has been associated with a pandemic, but like the, the disease itself, right? The mysterious origins, origins of it. The, why, why is the president choosing to do these things, you know, when Trump was president? You know, like, why isn't everyone getting their vaccine? What are the truths behind this? All this stuff that they're trying to figure out. And like a lot of times I don't have answers for. And so that, that discussion for me felt very fresh. When did you write it? Um, before the pandemic, for sure. <laughs> um, I can't remember exactly when I wrote this poem, maybe about three or four years ago. Um, I mean, it's, I wrote this when my son was too young for him to do any of these things. So, so it was before, it wasn't poem, based on something that happened with an actual child no. of yours, right? It was an imaginary uh, discussion. It's an imagined narrative, um, but, uh, but it's the kind of thing that my daughter would do. Um, it, the, the way that the boy in the poem keeps turning their answers back against them is the kind of thing that my daughter would do all the time when she was say six, seven, eight. Um, and uh, and the, the weird kind of innocence of doing that. And yet it's so exasperating to the parents, but she's just very earnestly or in the poem, he's just very earnestly saying, yeah, but I, you said we don't know what death is. So I wanna find out, um, you know, that, um, that, that interaction is the kind that is very familiar to me as a parent of two kids. And, and I learned about that first with my daughter. I also feel like as a parent, and this relates to what maybe Sugi was talking about a little bit before uh, 
with the masking and the kids having to learn to deal with it. Like there's never been a time in my life where I felt like I knew the answers that my children, the answers to the questions that my children had less, you know, like, yeah, okay. I yeah. can't explain about death, but there's a lot of other things that have come up now in the last year, 18 months that I do not understand and cannot fully explain to them. Um, and, you know, your, your poem is sort of dealing with that uncertainty. Uh, you know, you include the children in the work, but you don't quote their voices. You don't assume their vision. In other words, you don't presume to understand them. In fact, in this poem, you're not only outside the child, you're outside the dad, who's the character that you identify with. Could you sort of talk about that choice? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's there's a way that when you're writing, at least when I'm writing, I think this is probably true of most writers, you make these initial intuitive choices that are purposive, but the writing is often in the service of trying to figure out what the purpose is. Um, so, you know, I think I had a, an instinctual sense that I wanted the, if you can, if this term makes sense, sort of the camera of the poem, right, the vantage of the poem, to be fairly far outside of the action, to, to not be inside any of these characters' interior lives too fully, and, and particularly the kid is mysterious because ultimately, in my mind, the vantage is, if, if it's anyone's vantage, it's the parent's vantage. Um, and, uh, but, but I didn't want to over-explain that. I wanted to keep the camera at a distance, the vantage at a distance for the most part. And, um, and I, I think it became clear to me that the reason for that is that the poem was about the fact that the child, the child's um, actions couldn't really be known or explained, that there's something about that interior life of the child that is mysterious to everyone, uh, including the parents, and um, that we're all mysterious to each other in this way. Um, but, uh, and that we only have the exterior representations of the interior self to, um, to make sense of that other person's interior self. And I think that's very true of parents and their kids. And I think that's to be respected. Um, you know, I think that I'm very suspicious of parents who who claim to understand everything about their kids. You know, when you hear parents talk about their kids that way, I'm like, I'm pretty sure you're wrong. Um, and so I only um, really know when they're hungry. That exactly, I feel like I know exactly. Yeah, no, I, I feel like I know that too. That's exactly my point. <laughs> um, so that is like ninety you know, percent of the time. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah, it's just a good guess that they're hungry. When in doubt, hungry. Um, but yeah, so I think that, that, I, that I started the poem from that vantage, not knowing what the purpose of that would be. And by the time I got to that closing image of the, 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 the dog sealed in darkness, which to me is the dog, but is also a representation of these interiors that are all sealed in darkness. Um, I think that, uh, that, that that had paid off. So when you and I were corresponding about this interview, you pointed out six poems as the ones that, that mention children. It's a good chunk of the collection. And Parable of Childhood was one of those poems. And the opening poem, which is called The News, was not. I love that poem. And um, oh, and I think still, you know, perhaps because you'd mentioned in the essay, you know, imagining your kids reading your work and what would they think. Um, I kind of found myself reading that poem, The News, as though it were a conversation between a parent and a child. Um, and I was wondering if you would read it for us. Uh, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Um, so I'll I'll just set this up the way I, I intend, the way in my mind the poem is read, the, who the voices are. But then, um, but then I think you're right um, because the situation is similar in my mind. This is a poem where you know the, the news has brought on one of these like experts who spent a lifetime studying, in this case, economics and this city called death or this country called death. Um, and, uh, and, and, and he's supposed to explain sort of everything he knows in 45 seconds in response to these really kind of asinine news questions. Um, and, uh, and when I got to thinking about this, I think that, that this is similar to our experience of, of parenthood in a way that, you know, you have this lifetime of experience and then you have these moments that you try to say things to your kids <laughs> that like summarize a lifetime of experience and it's inevitably a failure, right? You're just not able to summarize. The only thing you can do is sort of fumble along saying things that you know when you can. 
And that's why this is a sort of false exercise on the news that we see all the time. And I think it's also a false exercise for parents that, that I often participate in, um, but, but it always fails. So anyway, here's this, this news conversation. There are two voices here. There's a question and then an answer. And um, I think that's clear when I read it. The news. What nation has the most robust economy? Death. And on what is that economy built? The end of pain. What are death's most notable exports? In completion, oil, and the arts. What about imports? Death is the largest consumer of voices and, of course, bodies. What are death's primary challenges? It has none. Its economy is an inexorable machine. What then should our strategy be? I'm afraid we have no choice but to expand our relationship with death. And how do we do that? We should ask, what are the needs of its citizens? Given our resources, what can we do for them? Thank you. I feel like that line, I'm afraid we have no choice but to expand our relationship with death is like something that Mitch McConnell said once at like the beginning of the Trump's presidency. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. I mean, that's that's when I wrote this poem. Um, and, uh, you know, that that sense. Well, so. Um, so, yeah, I think that the poem does. Um, it can easily be read as being about contemporary American politics or world politics, a kind of growth of authoritarianism around the world. I don't think it has to be isolated to America. I think we see this movement all over the world right now. Yeah, you know, uh, and that's work. It brings us back to this sort of ongoing discussion we've been having during this interview is like, the difficulty of talking to the children about the news, you know, not just about the pandemic. I had a, I posted something about from 2000, 2019 because I got one of those like on Facebook, like you did this in 2019. It was like this vacation I took with the kids up in Minnesota where we actually visited Sugi and we were staying at a lake or whatever. And I was like, I wrote originally like this was back in the good old days, you know, we did this. And then I realized like, no, 2019 sucked. It was awful. I thought it was terrible. You know, there were all these horrible political things going on and police shootings and kids in cages. And we were, you know, like it just got worse, but that doesn't mean that 2019 was good. Right. And that was the context you're writing this book in, you know, in, in a certain extent. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, so I think this poem is, um, it sort of is doing two things at once. And I think this is why I put it at the beginning of the book. Um, I think that it's, um, on the one hand, it can be read as about uh, politics, authoritarianism, ecological disaster, anything that seems like a growing relationship with death in our future uh, and our present, um, I think feels uh, like that sort of public sphere um, can be one of the lenses through which you see the poem. But I think the poem also can be about uh, middle age. I'm 45, I'm entering, um, I, yeah, I forget when I, <laughs> uh, I, I read that, you know, there are like, like 10 different definitions for when middle age begins, but I've had a number of friends die in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, this growing relationship with death that the poem speaks about can also be um, personal and, 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 and interior, you know, the sense that as we get older, we have to deal with mortality more and more often. And so, um, and that's why I wanted at the front of the book because the, the book itself is sort of equally about that public sphere and about a domestic sphere. And this was the poem that was able to do, I think um, both of those things simultaneously. And that was, that was a good way to my way of thinking to, to get into the book. Did you talk to your kids about politics during this time? Me? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, we did. Um, so my wife is a licensed clinical social worker who has some expertise in talking to kids about difficult subjects. Um, and I pretty much follow her lead on this stuff. Um, but I think both of us agreed um, early on that we didn't want to lie to our kids. We wanted to tell them things that were true, but we wanted to do it calmly and in a way that didn't feel like it was sensationalizing. Um, and, you know, at the same time, we spend a lot of time not saying 
that we are inherently right, but you know, that's the that's the easiest way to get kids who have the opposite politics of you is for you to for you to push them towards your point of view. So, you know, we say, here's what we think. Here's what's happening, here's what we think about it. Um, and that's been kind of our approach. I'm not sure that's the right approach. <laughs> I don't know if there is a right approach to dealing with the contemporary world and kids, but um, or there is one right approach, but but that's been what that's what we've been doing has been saying, um, you know, here, here's what's happening, here's what happened today. We don't know what it means. Here's what we think about it. I think there's some value in in offering your own uncertainty about things. Um, and you know, we would say about the pandemic, we don't we don't know what's going to happen, but we know that there are good people doing things to take care of other people and trying to help. And um, and you know, there are experts who are studying this virus. And so you know, on the one hand, we don't want to give them a false sense of certainty, but we also don't want them to be fearful. Um, uh, unduly, and we should all be fearful, but uh, we don't want them to be unduly fearful. And so we try to emphasize the, the ways in which there are um, positives, even in, uh, in a terrible situation. It's true of politics, true of the virus, all of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I can't help but think as you're talking about kind of, I don't know, the potential for political backlash among one's own next generation of like just sort of right that's the entire premise of of um like Alex P Keaton being a major yes. character of of <laughs> I mean I, I have to bring him up don't I right like um like family ties or um I don't know then I, I was thinking before to go back to the thing I was talking about earlier I was realizing that the ways in which that I I have also been called upon to explain the virulence of my own rhetoric in response to Trump and his administration like the sort of way in which I had paired a certain kind of like very ferocious rhetoric with opposition to that administration and many of its policies. And like now that administration is gone, certainly many of its after effects remain, certainly have many criticisms of the Biden administration. And I have sometimes heard children around me kind of continue that virulent rhetoric in context, like they don't know how to port it to context where it is appropriate or like how to dial it down for or modulate it. And then I'm like, oh my God, we spent four years talking about Trump like this around children. And they think it's like, it's like, did I normalize this kind of, and like, how do I explain to them that that was like a special exception? They were born into, I mean, I'm not saying I think he was the only bad politician ever, and he's clearly, clearly not, but like the register of everything I said was different. And I was thinking about that as I was reading, I felt like the poem, the news kind of led me perfectly into um, like probably my other favorite poem in your collection, which is stages on a journey westward, um, where, you know, it begins all the map makers in history have been wrong, but to vastly differing degrees, mostly it hasn't mattered, right? We spent all this time belaboring degree and detail and, and I'm grateful for nuance, but also like, how is this something you can explain yeah. to a kid? Um, can you talk a little bit about that poem? Yeah. Um... Yeah, so the, the title of that poem comes from a James Wright poem. Um, I'm uh, just, you know, stealing his title. In fact, I, I have a lot of little moments in this book that are kind of private jokes to me and maybe to the 12 other people who have read the particular poems I'm referencing because it is poetry after all. But, um, and uh, so that poem, um, that poem, I wrote that poem right after we moved to Denver. Um, and I was thinking about a couple different things at once. I was thinking about um, sort of what what America is, which is you know a, a giant abstraction <laughs> that has you know real effects in the world all the time. Um, but but that sort of combination of abstract concept and very small physical details that make up the landscape. I think that's one thing I was thinking about in the poem, and then. Kind of an, as, an, as an extension of that, I was thinking about the, the, the idea of manifest destiny and westward expansion and all of this mythology that the United States built around, um, around the West. And I was moving from Kansas City to Denver just for a job. I mean, not for not on a wagon train or anything like that. But, um, but I felt in a weird way like I was, uh, I was in my own small way participating, whether I liked it or not, in this kind of myth. Um, of, of moving west and then um, like I couldn't help but feel that. 
Um, and then I also just felt like, you know, as much as so much of America has been abstraction and myth, that abstraction and myth has been a massive draw to people all over the world for a very long time. And that abstraction and myth has come with real opportunities for a lot of people and has also come at the expense of a whole lot of people. And all of that complication is interesting to me. I was a history major in, in college. So, I mean, this is stuff that I, I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, and so I wanted to think about the ways in which that those abstract ideas, the way the myth of America has been, I think, complicated for me, I mean, the, not just by the Trump years, but really going back to sort of post 9-11. And I think, I mean, in my political opinion, the kinds of mistakes we made right after 9-11, which have just had very, very long uh, shadows. I think Trump is just one of those shadows in a way. Um, uh, and um, so, so yeah, I, I was thinking about all of that stuff, but then I was also just thinking about traveling with a family, um, <laughs> to come back to family, traveling with a family um, across uh, Kansas, which is an absurd, you know, six, seven, eight hour drive, depending how many times you stop. Where oh my you God, my wife who's from California really, really hates Kansas. She would like to, she just oh, wonders yeah. why I can't just be eliminated, not like physically. <laughs> Not yeah. just, at, you know, like, can't you just fold this up a little bit and make it shorter? There's really yeah. no purpose to this. I mean, Kansas City is the next major city on the highway from Denver, but I will always fly it. Um, not because it isn't a beautiful landscape, but you could just tie off your steering wheel and like go to sleep for seven hours um, because there's just, you know, there's the road is so straight. The landscape is flat. It's beautiful, but it's flat. Um, and and, and Flint Hills has no, yeah, Flint Hills, yeah. But um, so yeah, I mean, the poem is sort of thinking about all of those things, and uh, and maybe thinking about where abstraction meets the particulars and and uh, of the landscape, and more to the point, doesn't meet the particulars of the landscape. This idea of how history is told and 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 how children receive history and learn about history, whether they're learning a myth about America, or whether they're learning a more real version of America, that. That is a conversation that I've had with my children quite a bit, yeah. and it's complicated because I would say to them, "I like my parents are no Trump supporters, but they were they and they have changed their politics really a lot in the last decade. But when I was a kid, they were like standard moderate Republicans, right? They liked Reagan, and to them, like the bicentennial was like, this is great, two hundred years, it's fantastic, you know. I mean, I was nine years old, and it's, it was all." 100% Americana, right? No, well, we're going to discuss the Native American mm -hmm. issue of, the, you know, like that was not part of the, there's none of that discussion of race, nothing, none, right? Fully, fully insulated from that and into the deep, what is now right-wing myth of America, right? But yet, boy, I had a lot fewer things to worry about. I mean, I learned those things all later, you know, but was, is it better for them to be learning them now? You know, for me to be discussing what critical race theory is with them now, which I do, I think it's important, you know, like, um, I don't know, you know, but I certainly know that my life was a lot more insulated from complication when I was younger. And then, of course, there's a whole set of, sorry, Wayne, go ahead. No, I, well, I was just going to say, I, you know, I, mine was maybe a little, a little more complicated. I, I, my father was an English professor, uh, but a very working class English professor who was very much a fish out of water in academia for a lot of his, his life there. And uh, who was very progressive. I, I mean, we didn't use, I guess they didn't use that word then, but very liberal. Um, and I remember him explaining to me that he, you know, was deeply sympathetic to um, Marxist arguments. Um, at the same time, he was in the Air Force uh, and his first teaching job was at the Air Force Academy. And so, you know, I think a lot of the conversations I had with my dad when I, were, when I was young um, tried to capture a kind of both and quality to the discussion rather than, I mean, I, I think part of the problem of the Trump years um, is that the rhetoric of the right became um, so simultaneously extreme and ossified that, um, that, that it turns the conversation into an either or. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it forces, I think, the left into an either or. Well, they're saying these things about America, so we have to say the opposite. 
And, you know, I think that there's a certain amount of, uh, of both and, you know, this is a country that was obviously built, I mean, obviously built on genocide and slavery. It's not debatable. It's really easy to look at the history and see that immediately. It's also a country that inspired uh, by virtue of our revolution, uh, a lot of sort of new democracies and a, and a growth of, uh, of a kind of more representational government in Europe uh, and then uh, beyond that around the world. I mean, you can see, you know, the uh, one of the interesting things when I was in Northern Ireland, this is only tangentially related, but, um, but I was in Northern Ireland for seven months on a Fulbright. One of the things that was really interesting to me there was discovering that in fact, um, Bloody Sunday happened because the Catholics were marching inspired by Martin Luther King and civil rights. Like I didn't really understand that American civil rights had in fact um, been the inspiration for the Catholic civil rights movement in Northern Ireland, direct uh, influence. Like, I just didn't know that. Um, and you know, so I, I think that to just sort of either say this country is this one thing as I think the right has been doing to, to do the inverse of that is also problematic. The country has a lot of different things. Um, it's a massive country with a really, really complex history. And it's easy to cherry pick moments when the country has done good things. It's easy to, which, is, which has become a kind of political argument now. It's also easy to cherry pick moments when the country has done bad things and it's done a lot of them. But you know what I mean? Like. I, I also think that if you go around the world, you'd be hard pressed to find any other country that doesn't have a deeply conflicted history. Ours just happens to be so visible because we have inordinate power. Um, and you know that comes with significant responsibility and I wish we took it more seriously. But does that make sense? Like well, I my mean, sense I think, is that- Sue, sorry, you go were gonna say something. So I wanna, I'm gonna step in quickly and say, first of all, the isolation that I was allowed to have as a, as a kid is the definition of white privilege, right? That is yeah. like a, a, a black or brown kid in my same neighborhood, which, you know, yep. uh, would have had a very different experience at that time. And so I get that. That's part of the deal, right? And I don't, that, that is not the kind of privilege that I want my kids to have. But when you're talking about, um, uh, you know, the, the possibilities of America, I mean, Ralph Ellison was very much alive to that. If you look at his work and James McPherson, who was our professor, was, a, you know, also participated in thinking about positive and negative parts of America, I think. And, you know, if you look at Albert Murray and other essays that he really liked, I mean, I think you'll find those ideas there in that in, in, the, in those writings. So, Sugi, you were going to say something. What, were, what was it? I think it was along the lines of kind of what you were just saying about, I'm just imagining, um, right? There is a set of kids who, like these conversations about death are happening so differently, even for just like different American kids. Um, you know, how yeah. could I, being a person who lives in Minneapolis, um, not be thinking about this all the time? And on a land, like, what is it? I think I recently explained to, I think I recently explained to someone like what a land grant university is. Like we might as well call them like settler colonialism <laughs> universities. like. <laughs> that would be blunter. Like, I mean, why do we have this euphemism built into everything that we say? Um, and yeah, and I to think that, that extent, I'm glad that my kids are, you know, alive and in a time when there's an open dialogue about police violence, for instance, like I, I want them to go to, you know, marches that happen here in Kansas City. And I want them to be aware of that. I'm glad that they're doing that. Anyway, we can't have you read this poem because it's long and it's a fantastic poem. I especially like the ending lines and sort of the last um, couple of verses. So I just want to tease that for our listeners that you should definitely pick up Wayne's new collection, We the Jury. Um, Wayne, thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you guys so much for having me.